Let's be seated, brothers and sisters, and turn our, our Bibles to Acts chapter 1. For me, the most uh, tangible evidence that God is real, that God exists, that He is who He is, is just His creation. The earth, the space, the oceans, you and I. That's the most tangible proof for me that God exists. Acts chapter 1, Acts chapter 1. Um, it's the most tangible evidence for me. And the second piece of tangible evidence for me is this collection of books, these collections of writings uh, that we call the Bible. And the writings, the accounts that have been documented from different men, women over time, testifying who God is. And this documentation we have of these prophecies and seeing those prophecies actually being fulfilled. And so when I read the Bible and study the Bible and, and look at it, for me it's, it's real. And so when I read it, either it's a historical account that, that I see laying out or a prophetic account of something that's going to be in the future, I try to envision it and think about it like it is real. Not like it's some dream or not like it's some something that's not real, tangible to me. Cindy was asking me yesterday, you know, people that I don't meet and she talks about, she always says, you, you know what I'm talking about? And I'm like, no. She's like, why do I always have to tell you these people's names over and over again? And I said, because I don't know them, and when I know somebody, and when I see somebody, and when I, it becomes real for me, tangible for me. And so when I meet one of the friends that she talks about from the homeschool thing and stuff, and then I'm like, okay, now i got something tangible, and you can talk about that person again, and I know who it is. And, I, and, I, and it's the same way for me for the scriptures and God, right? It's like it's tangible, it's real to me, and, and I can know who he is. And whenever we read these accounts, even the time of Jesus, I rewind it back, and, and I try to act like, this probably sounds weird, right? But that I'm an observer watching these events happen, watching these things uh, be fulfilled and take place. And so when I read Acts chapter 1, um, I try to think about it in the real sense of what, what is occurring here and what is happening here. So in Acts chapter 1, um, it, it, it's talking about, uh, start with verse 1, the former treatise have I made of the office of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. Until the day when he was taken up, after that he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen to whom he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs being seen of them forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So again, I'll try to make it real, right? Jesus, this is after his death. It's after his burial. It's after his resurrection. And he presents himself, remember back in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the accounts, he presents himself to the disciples. And they're like, he's alive. He's alive. That was not a one-time thing. I mean, you know, he appeared to a couple along the road, and he appeared to everybody in the in the room. Remember he told Thomas, stick your fingers in the holes in my hands. You know, look at me, touch me, feel me. It wasn't a two-time event, a three-time event. How many days does it say here that he was with people? after this 40 days it's easy to read 40 days i think but if you say i'm going to start today and i'm going to count 40 days that i spent time with mario 40 days that i spent time with lupe 40 days that i spent time with chris you know you look back on that and that that's that's a that's a lot of time right 40 days it says that he spent time with them showing himself many, many infallible proofs. He was preaching and teaching, speaking the things of the kingdom of God. So 40 days he was with them. After 
the resurrection had taken place after he had returned. Um, verse 4, and being assembled together with him, commanded them they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which, which saith he, you have heard of me. For John shall be baptized with water, but he shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost, not in any days thence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, would thou at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? So they're all there together. They're all staying in Jerusalem. They're all waiting. They're all being patient here at this point of years, waiting for this Holy Ghost to appear. And they're asking him questions and say, you know, when, when, will, the, when will the kingdom be restored again? Verse 7, he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. So what was his response? It ain't none of your business, right? This is God's business. It's not for you to know the times and seasons. This is not, you know, something for you to have control over. You need to know. This is a need to know basis only, and you don't need to know this. But he says, you're going to receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, verse 8, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Witnesses of his ministry before his death, ministry witnessing of his death, of his resurrection, of his return to this earth and spending 40 days among the people. Verse 9, And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. So he's, he's talking to them, he's answering questions, he's been with them for 40 days now, and it says while he was speaking to these things, he gets taken up in the air, right? And a cloud receives him out of their sight. So this, he goes up in the air, and this cloud comes, and he disappears. And again, I try to put myself in the situation and make this real. Right? So we're all standing out in the parking lot. We're all standing out in the parking lot, and he's standing there, and then he goes up in the air, and there's a cloud, and he disappears. It's real. Verse 10, And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, Two men stood by them in white apparel. So imagine yourself there witnessing this. Jesus goes up in the air. Everybody's, everybody's looking, looking up. What happened? What happened? And then what does it say appeared before them? Two men. Two men in white apparel. Verse 11, which said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? What are you, what are you standing there? What are you staring at? What are you looking at? You know when somebody's looking up in the sky, everybody else wants to too, right? You ever watch that? You go outside and start looking up in a crowd of people, and pretty soon everybody's, they want to see what it is, right? What's up there? He says, why are you gazing in heaven? Why are you standing there looking up? This same Jesus, listen to what, he said, what, what they say here. This same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. So they're all standing around there. They're having this conversation with Jesus. All of a sudden, it says that it was up in the air. This cloud comes, takes, he disappears. And they're standing around these, these two in white apparel, asking, what are you doing? What are you standing here looking for? What are you looking at? Says this same Jesus, which was taken up from you into heaven, shall come in like manner as you sit, have seen him go into heaven. So, when he comes back, he will come back in like manner. Like manner, right? In the same way. When he comes, what? When he comes back, he'll come back in the same manner in which he left here. Is what it says. And how did he leave? He was taken up in the cloud and disappeared out of their sight. So if it's like manner, 
we can assume that what's going to be associated with his return? A cloud? Is he going to come up out of the ground? Is he going to come up out of the ocean? Is he going to bust out of a big mountain? Is he going to be spewed out of a volcano? How is it going to, how is it, if, if, if they're, what they're saying is true, how is he going to return? He's going to come down from heaven. There's going to be some clouds going on here, right? Is what the account here is in Acts. Now, does your Bible have any notes on who wrote Acts? So it says it's a companion of Paul. A companion of Paul, yeah. Anybody have any notes? So mystery man, huh? A companion of Paul. Anybody have any notes? Who wrote Acts? Peter. Peter? Is that what yours says? Um, You're just guessing. It says of Peter's ministry. Of, of Peter's ministry. But it also was of Paul's ministry and the early disciples' ministry, right? He says it's the second volume of Luke's gospel. Second volume of Luke's gospel, yeah. So I've seen several theories about, you know, there's, it's not very clear, clear who actually wrote the book of Acts. Well, I, well, chapter 1 through 12 for Peter's ministry, and then 13 through 28, it says Paul's ministry. It's about their ministries, yeah, right? But, but who was writing about it? Clear. So, we have an account here from somebody who's writing, um, saying this is the way. The way Jesus left is the way he's going to return. It's the way he's going to come back. Let's turn to First Thessalonians chapter four, verses thirteen to seventeen. Who wrote Thessalonians? Do we know that? Paul. Oh, so we do know that. So. You got an, uh, did Paul write any other stuff? Yeah. Yeah, well, Paul wrote lots of stuff, right? A lot of these letters that we see here are written by Paul. So let's see what Paul has to say according to this. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 17. You have to pay attention to the details. It says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. So he, he's writing them in this letter. He's, he's going to talk here about you know, those that have passed away, those the Bible describes death as asleep many times. So I'm, I'm, I don't want you to be ignorant about what this means. Verse 14, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain, shall not prevent them which are asleep. So if we're alive and are here on this earth, when, uh, when the time comes, uh, we won't prevent, we won't stop those who have already passed away uh, from the same resurrection. We won't prevent them. Verse 16, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which were alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we be ever with the Lord. So see how Paul is writing about you know, this return? This return of who says this? The Jesus, the Lord. So we're, we're, we that are dead, and the, we're, if we're dead in, in the grave or if we're alive and here, when he returns, it says that the Lord himself shall descend from heaven. And then the dead in Christ will rise, those that are alive in Christ will rise together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Remember what they said in Acts chapter 1, verse 11? Why are you standing up and gazing? The same way, the same manner that Jesus was taken up, went up into the air and the cloud disappeared, is the same way 